There are a lot of things in photography I find I lack the confidence in knowing if I'm making the right calls on, and to some extent even just talking about. The question of how much resolution is enough resolution is one of those things that I've struggled with over the years. And while I can't say I have it figured out, I have at least reached a point where I'm confident enough in my decisions to be able to talk about them and how I got to them. Oh, one thing before I get started. I think people have a natural tendency to perceive numbers as precise values. 10 megapixels is 10 megapixels. It's not 8 or 11. However, like most things in photography, this is one of those places where the numbers are fuzzy. So I'm going to talk about numbers in this video, but don't get too hung up on the exact numbers. Instead, consider them a, an approximate point of reference. So making big prints is a big part of what's awesome about photography for me. And while that directly impacts things like how I compose my images, which is actually a really good subject for another video, it also means worrying about resolution far more than, say, if I was just targeting the web or mobile devices. Now, admittedly, over time, I've been able to blunt some of those fears. Uh, partly that's come from experience, and partly that's just thanks to higher resolution cameras. However, I started thinking about resolution again because of getting an EOS R5, and especially because of the camera's APS-C crop mode. So let's see, how much resolution is enough? And for that matter, how do you even go about answering that question? So for a long time, I was firmly in the more, more, more camp. Uh, of course, when I started out, I was shooting with 10 megapixel cameras and, well, wanting more resolution is entirely reasonable. However, the real problem I had was a, a complete lack of printing experience. Big prints are expensive to make, and I didn't want to waste money printing something that would just end up torn up and in the trash. And, man, when I started printing, I was clueless. What I did at the very beginning was just arbitrarily picked a minimum resolution, uh, 240 pixels per inch, if I remember correctly. And if I couldn't meet that, I didn't print the picture. I didn't consider things like viewing distance, I didn't consider artistic concerns, or, or really anything. Just that pixel per inch number. Now, in my defense, like I said, I was a noob. I didn't yet own a decently sized photo printer at the time, and so I was printing everything using Costco's photo lab. And while their prices were low, the hassle involved in a 40-minute round trip to go pick up the prints and, and bring them back and made it kind of hard to experiment. It, you couldn't do anything spontaneously. Now, it didn't take me long to realize that that whole th thought process wasn't workable, at least if I wanted to print even, say, 12 by 18-inch prints from my 10-megapixel cameras. So I obviously needed a higher-res camera, but in 2008 or 9, that was a really expensive proposition. And in the meantime, I had to do something and cut the print resolution down to somewhere around, say, 200 pixels per inch. Now, this was all still arbitrary, and I still had was more concerned about hitting that number rather than how the actual prints looked. It was about here that I started trying to go down the road of like looking at visual acuity and hoping to find some reassurances there. And suffice to say, while I found knowledge, I didn't find an answer. The, the thing, the pro real problem in a lot of respects was that I just didn't trust my eyes and my judgment as an artist. Uh, I wanted something objective. My nagging, almost certainly irrational fear was that someone would tell me my print was low res crap. And the best that I could say in response was, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. I think it looks fine. What I really wanted to be able to do was call BS on them and tell them they were wrong because the print was, uh, print's resolution exceeded the eye's ability to resolve detail and ha, take that. Or, well, maybe with a bit more tact. And, you know, that naturally, like I said, led me to looking at visual acuity and trying to work backwards from there. So, What's the threshold of visual acuity? So it's not hard to find a number for that. However, if you start doing some digging, it's not hard to find many numbers for that. And then that there are several types of visual acuity, too. 
all throughout all of that, the most reasonable values that I found for the kind of visual acuity that's most relevant to looking at a, a print equate to between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 arc minutes per pixel. So for example, in his article on the topic, Dr. Roger Clark uses uh, 0 0.3 arc minutes for visual acuity and then calculates that for a 20 by 13.3 inch print viewed from 20 inches, you'd need 74 megapixels for that print to be at the threshold of human vision. However, it's not quite that simple. And it's not the visual acuity side of things that's the problem, it's the viewing distance side of things. So lenses, including our eyes, are angular resolving instruments. That is, they don't resolve a spot that's say five millimeters in diameter at every distance. Instead, they resolve an angle. And because of that, the size of the spot changes with the distance from the lens or the person. In other words, the closer you get to a print, the more resolution the print needs in pixels per inch because you are able to see finer detail. Then what's the right viewing distance? Well, the factors that dictate natural, uh, a natural comfortable viewing distance bring us back to talking about our eyes. So our eyes really only do have a narrow cone where that high resolution vision exists. Say, try reading something while deliberately keeping it in your peripheral vision and you'll see what I mean. To compensate for that, our brain moves the eye around, sweeping that high resolution cone over a larger field of our view, and then pieces together a perception of the world, or the picture, in that higher detail. Now, the more your eye has to move to do this, the more eye strain there can be. Again, just try looking all the way in any direction and you'll feel what I'm talking about. And of course, the more of your field of view that a print covers, the more your eyes have to move to see all of it. Moreover, prints aren't the real world they represent. Uh, focusing on something up close is another pot potential source of eye strain. We might want to, for example, lean into a picture of a lion on the Serengeti in order to feel more immersed in the scene or make out more detail in the lion's mane. But looking at the print, we're not focusing on something that was tens of feet away in an environment that completely surrounds our, and fills our vision. We're focusing on a picture that's maybe only tens of inches away. So due to both of these factors, viewing distance varies with print size. There are other complexities too, although that gets really complicated. One paper, for example, that I read found that the density of photoreceptors in our eyes falls off faster in the vertical axis than it does in the horizontal. And as such, you'd have a wider cone of high resolution vision in your, you know, horizontally than you do vertically. And as drawing that into prints, that might affect the viewing distance or comfortable viewing distances for a vertical print versus a horizontal one. And really, there's all kinds of questions here. I mean, you know, we're, we're asking what is the preferred angle of view for a print, but then is that consistent for all print sizes? Does the print's orientation affect that viewing distance? Uh, and so on. So unfortunately, I don't have any good answers to these questions. And the unfortunate thing is, is I haven't found any good research to answer them either. When I wrote my print resolution calculator, the, re the research that I did suggested using the diagonal of the print. But as far as I could tell, that was more of a rule of thumb than anything backed up with science and research. However, uh, using the diagonal of print and going back to our 13 point, uh, our 20 by 13.8 inch print, the viewing distance would be 24 inches. And that would mean that we'd only need 56 megapixels to satisfy the threshold of visual acuity, not 74. For me, all these questions just raise a bigger one. And that is, is this even the right approach? I mean, certainly some knowledge about our vision is important and knowing its limits can certainly be useful, but it's not like there's a clear answer here either. In fact, every time I look into this, I walk away with more questions than answers. And the thing is to me, a picture isn't reality and it's never going to be. 
So when we're looking at a print, we're looking at something that's already heavily distorted to by the photographer's vision, his choice of lenses, all those things. And that's even before we factor in how our emotional response to that picture affects our perception of the image. So, uh, you know, does a picture even need to get close to the threshold of human vision to be effective as art? Well, I'm not convinced. And if that's the case, what then? The next thing I turned to was looking at film. Uh, when I was young, my dad was a serious photographer and even working as a semi-pro at times, and that meant our house was decorated with a lot of his photography. We had prints of his made from 35 millimeter film that were enlarged to 16 by 20 inches, and quite honestly, they looked good. I couldn't see real problems with them. Moreover, you know, much of photography's history was shot on film. And there are many compelling images that have been shot on 35 millimeter film, and many have been made into large prints. So, you know, maybe if film has been good enough for that long, maybe it's good enough to keep going for. Now, when it comes to talking about film online, I have seen a lot of mysticism over film in, you know, blogs and so forth. I've seen everything from claims of massive amounts of dynamic range to having virtually unlimited resolution, you know, because it's analog. And the reality is, is that film is kind of limited. And, you know, I can understand where this comes from. Being analog, film doesn't neatly translate to digital terms. It's complicated. And because of that, there's a lot more room for the theory to not necessarily work out in practice or the assumptions not really carry through. That said, I'm gonna still talk about it at least in some coarse terms. So in another one of Dr. Clark's articles, he looked at film's digital equivalent resolution. And I'm not gonna get into the ins and outs of how he figured that out, but to briefly summarize his results, for 35 millimeter film at ASA 50, he saw or came up with a digital equivalent resolution of around 16 megapixels. And if you used the same film stock at the same speed and shot with a 645 or medium format camera, that number increased to around 51 megapixels. However, as ASA increases, the grain structure has to get larger to provide that greater sensitivity. By ASA 100, the 35 millimeter film's digital equivalent resolution dropped to around six megapixels, and the medium format film of the same type dropped to around 21 megapixels. Though, one thing to be clear here is that in all of these cases, talking about digital equivalent resolution, the numbers should be considered extremely soft, with a margin of error of several megapixels in either direction. All that said, his results my, mirror my subjective experiences. In the past, I've scanned ASA 200 and 400 films, and I found that the images were inferior in terms of detail to the 10 megapixel images my DSLRs were producing. Now, on top of all of that, prior to scanning and digital reproduction, printing images incurred a generational loss or degradation. That is, not all of the resolution in the negative that came out of the camera would actually make it into the enlargement or the print. The, that, of course, raises the question, well, how much information was lost? And there, I'm not entirely sure. The only study I had handy or have handy for this was done for cinematography, and that uses a completely different printing process that's not really relevant for still photography. That said, in their case, they found that the first generation lost uh, somewhere around 20-ish percent of resolution. Now, none of this isn't an indictment of film as an artistic medium. If anything, there are advantages to film in the modern era, if only because it produces an inherently limited artifact with a, a built-in amount of scarcity. However, as far as resolution goes, if you're shooting with a 20 to 24 megapixel camera, which is what most modern mirror interchangeable lens cameras are now anyway, you're already beating 35 millimeter film and approaching medium format film in a lot of cases. 
so is 24 megapixels good enough then? I mean, you could say it's better than 35 millimeter film and that's been good enough for years. But honestly, I don't find that a satisfying answer either. And to be honest, that's kind of the problem. I don't think there's a good objective answer here anywhere. Instead, I think you have to end up, or you end up just having to lean on experiment, uh, experience, experimentation, and just learning to trust your eyes. Obviously, testing your, for yourself is absolutely necessary. However, one thing that I found that's incredibly useful is to look at other photographers' work in person. This is especially true if they're successful at selling those images as large prints. So for me, the revelation happened when I visited one of Peter Lick's galleries. If you're not familiar with Peter Lick and his work, his thing is big prints. Small for one of his prints is in the 24 by 36 inch class or two by three foot. And his sizes just go up from there. The smallest images that he had on, on display in his galleries or his gallery, uh, at least the one I visited, were at four by six foot minimum. And they went all the way up to wall filling prints that were 12 or more feet high and 20 or 30 feet long. Now, going into this, I also knew a little bit about how he was shooting things, or at least what he had said online about that. However, that's not absolutely necessary. Uh, some of the behind the scenes stuff that he had published on his website or an interview uh, that I had seen, and this was back in 2015 or 2016, showed him using medium format digital cameras and implied, or it might've stated outright, that he didn't use stitching techniques. So consequently, I could assume that the prints that I saw in his gallery were coming between, from between 40 to 80 megapixel source files, as that's the kind of camera gear that would have been available to him in the 2015 and earlier kind of era. However, uh, the real question here is how did the images stand up? And for me at least, they were fine if you stood at reasonable viewing distances. Something like what I talked about earlier, somewhere around the diagonal of a print, plus or minus a bit, that worked great. But in many cases, the prints fell apart when you got much closer than that. And in some of the most extreme cases, like the really big wall-sized prints, they were quite blocky from anything under maybe 10 or 15 feet away. But this isn't an indictment of the quality of Peter Lick's work. The reality is nobody views a four by six foot print from one foot away. Well, except for maybe a photographer looking for faults. And so it doesn't need to be visually perfect for that close of a viewing distance. He knew that and he knew what was acceptable and fundamentally that was the problem I was struggling to figure out. So here I was going into this and I'm worrying about needing 100 megapixels or more to make a two by three foot print and Peter Lick's printing a, pr a print that's twice that size with like maybe half that resolution. And the thing is the results worked visually and Maybe more importantly, the prints actually sold for thousands of dollars. Now, granted, I don't believe that financial success is an indicator of technical or artistic quality. It's way more complicated than that. Yet, at the same time, when you're asking, say, $10,000 for a photographic print, people aren't going to pay that if what you're delivering is low-res crap. So in some very real ways, maybe the real lesson that I got wasn't so much about how much resolution you need, because that is kind of arbitrary, but maybe more about what is acceptable in the market for those buying large high-end prints. And it was visiting his gallery that really got me serious about printing my own images as big as I could, damn the megapixels. And as cliche as it sounds, gave me the courage to print the Antelope Valley image that you see uh, behind me. So as I said earlier, big prints are expensive. A, a 20 by 60 or 30 by 90 inch print can run close to $100 or more, uh, obviously depending on where you get them printed and the kind of paper they're printed on and so forth. And you know, throwing away that kind of money on a bad print is not something I want to or really can afford to do. 
So let's talk about this specific print. It's a 20 by 60 inch print, granted you can't see it all in the frame here, uh, that is cropped from a single 30 megapixel frame. And altogether that works out to just 15 megapixels of information behind that print. And pixel per inch wise, that's 112 pixels per inch. Now, honestly, that's not what I'd call high resolution. And yet in practice, the image looks fine even getting up close and scrutinizing it at like, say, one or two feet away, it holds up well enough to not look bad. Not that anybody ever views the print like that. Now, would I wanna go larger? Well, not really, but even that depends on where and how it's being displayed. So a 30 by 90 of this print would drop the resolution to only 74 pixels per inch. And that's lower than the resolution of a standard computer monitor. But you know, that might be completely reasonable if you can't get closer to four or five feet from the print. And maybe in that case, the size is really necessary. Uh, another example is this lion portrait. It was cropped from a 5D Mark III's 22 megapixel frame down to only 5.5 megapixels. Now, this is a 16 and a quarter by 10.8 inch print. And for that much resolution, it works out to have 176 pixels per inch which actually not having done the math before this is actually a lot more than I had expected. But even at that resolution, which is pretty good, I'd say, there aren't any real quality problems to my eye looking at that print. And getting close up, uh, you know, things like the whiskers, they're nice and smooth. And truthfully, I could probably print that bigger, at least up to a full A3 plus size. So going back to the question, how much resolution do you need for your prints and therefore your camera? Well, unfortunately, I think what it comes down to is there's really no way to just put a universal number to that. Uh, part of the reason for this is that, you know, print resolution sets a floor for the minimum resolution you need uh, in a camera, uh, but it's not a hard line. It, it's gonna depend on, say, viewing distance and condition and how you're, uh, how you're displaying things. That said, in my experience, you often don't need mu as much resolution as you might think. And maybe that's the real lesson here, that there is no simple single number. This is art. And at some point as an artist, you have to make a judgment call on what's good enough for you. And the best approach I've found for that, as I said, is printing stuff and seeing if it works. And you know, if it doesn't take, it doesn't take too long doing that before you start to figure out what your actual personal minimums are. That said, I'm gonna give you some numbers. For me personally, if I have at least five or six megapixels, I'll give printing an A3 plus size image a chance. Um, however, that comes with a caveat to that. I print my own A3 plus images on my own printer and my costs are low enough for that, that if the print turns out poorly, I'm willing to trash it and chalk it up as a learning experience. If you're having to send those out, that might be a, a different situation. At eight megapixels, I'm usually pretty happy to print almost anything up to an A3 plus without really any concern. And for what it's worth, eight megapixels is an eight by 10 print at 300 pixels per inch. For larger prints like the 20 by 30s or, or 20 by 60s or whatever, I generally want at least twice that in terms of resolution. So 15 to 16 megapixels at a minimum. However, for those large prints, if I only have a 20 megapixel or less file, what I will do is I will print out a series of A3 plus test prints mosaic together, and then I'll tape them together to make a big you know, final image so that I can stick it up on a wall and see how it'll look before I actually send it out to be printed commercially where the real money ends up being. Now, all of that said, my dirty little secret is that no matter how much I can talk about being comfortable with printing at low resolutions, I really do want all the megapixels I can get in my big prints. Uh, for me, there's something immensely satisfying about being able to walk up to, say, a mountain landscape and see the individual pine trees on the top of the mountain. 
Uh, personally, maybe what I'm trying to communicate here is, and, is the most important takeaway is that you shouldn't be afraid to try printing your images big because you don't think you have the resolution. Uh, obviously, there's floors or bottoms to that limit, but, you know, give it a try. Uh, moreover, because you don't necessarily need thousands of megapixels to make a good print, you probably shouldn't feel that you have to have a super high resolution camera to make good quality large prints either. And, you know, truthfully, high resolution cameras aren't free lunch. The, the, and I'm not just talking about the cost, but I'll get into that in, I think, the next video on this. Anyway, thanks for sticking around all the way to the end. If you found this interesting, or if it's got you thinking about resolution and printing your images big, please consider smashing that thumbs up button. Likewise, if you'd like to see more content on photography and videography, please consider subscribing. Also, if you're gonna do that, I don't have a regular posting schedule, so you might wanna click that notification bell to be notified when I post a new video. I try to get one out about every week or two, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. Finally, you can find me on Twitter at Points and Focus, all one world, word, and feel free to check out my website at pointsandfocus.com. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.